to welcome you all to the regular meeting of the Spring Area Schools Board of Education for Tuesday, May 12th at 6.30 p.m. Please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance is to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you everyone for attending tonight. It's not very often we get such a large crowd, so we're here every other two, the second and fourth Tuesdays of the month. Care to join us? The first part on our agenda tonight is public comment. A member of the public may address the board briefly for up to three minutes or request to be scheduled on the agenda of a future meeting by filling out the how to address the Board of Education form that is provided prior to each meeting. Please note the Board of Education members will not respond directly to public comment. Individuals addressing the board should take into consideration the rules of common courtesy. The public participation portion of the meeting cannot be used to make personal attacks against the board member, district employee, or student. Do we have anyone who would like to have public comment for them? Okay. All right. Hi, my name is Heather Bannett, and I'm the president-elect of Stride. As many of you may know, Stride's main goal is to assure that the student voice is heard. I'm here today because I have been asked to represent the Screen Middle School girls regarding the dress code. So Jordan is handing out copies of both the Screen Middle School and Screen Middle School dress code right now. So if you look at rule number four that I've highlighted in yellow, the middle school dress code states that students, student dress should not detract from a productive, healthy, and safe learning environment at school. Some examples are short shorts, skirts, short shorts and skirts should be of appropriate length, fit, and must cover the upper thighs and must be longer than the fingertip when arms are fully extended along the sides and fingers fully extended. So, for example, my fingertips go to here, and that is the rule. So, with the recent climate temperature, short season has begun. Throughout the past few weeks, girls at Saline Middle School have been getting in trouble for wearing shorts to school because they do not reach their fingertips when their arms are at their sides. I understand that rules are rules, and if your shorts are not long enough, you must change out of them. However, many problems have arose due to this rule in the dress code. First, Saline Middle School girls are being singled out in the hallway and embarrassed by staff members in front of their friends because their shorts violate the dress code. What's wrong with a call home? One girl was even called out over a megaphone in the bus loop after school with hundreds of other kids around. According to another eighth grader, the same girls are repeatedly uh, being picked on for wearing shorts by the staff, while other girls wearing shorts of the same length are not being called out. In addition, this rule of the dress code is only enforced at the middle school level. This suggests that it is only inappropriate for middle school girls to wear these shorts, girls ages 12 to 14. If a dress code as such is going to be enforced, it needs to be fully enforced, punishing all girls at all levels of education, elementary to high school. Furthermore, most girls are going through puberty during their middle school years. As girls' bodies are changing, they become very self-conscious and feel uncomfortable in their own skin. Middle school girls are already concerned with what they wear to school, and pointing out a problem with their clothes only makes matters worse. This past Thursday, May 7th, several 8th grade girls deliberately wore athletic shorts to school knowing that it violated the dress code. <coughs> then, all of the 8th grade girls were called out of lunch for a meeting to reinforce the rules of the dress code. When the 8th graders were asked to were called into the auditorium, they, were at, they asked why their shorts were a problem. They were told that the shorts are inappropriate for school because school is a professional setting and they need to dress professionally. However, these are 12 to 14 year old girls attending a public school, not a professional job. They are hardly attempting to show up to school in nothing but undergarments. They want to wear shorts. With this, I would like to propose a change to the middle school dress code. Uh, I propose that the fingertip length rule be omitted and this portion of the dress code um, can match that of Saline High School. Thank you for your time and consideration. Okay, hi, my name is Erin Healy and I'm the newly elected Vice President of Stride. Hunter, could you come up here? So, these are the shorts that the girls got in trouble for wearing. Shorts, especially these, do not disrupt the productive, healthy, and safe learning environment that the dress code intends to protect. I am a junior in high school myself and I were wearing shorts to school and this does not detract from anyone's education in the slightest. My peers treat me with respect and I respect myself. I can still be treated as a mature and professional young adult while wearing shorts, and I am. This specific dress code is not enforced at the high school, and we still have a healthy learning environment. This policy is especially discriminatory against girls because girls are forced to search several different stores 
to find such long shorts, to find shorts of such length, girls are forced to go to like buy shorts online even because they're not in style, so parents have to spend even more money. Personally, I've always been tall. In middle school, even the longer length shorts weren't past my fingertips, so I had to wear jeans up until the very last day of school, which is not that fun. <laughs> As you can see on the high school dress code, it states that student dress should not detract from a productive, healthy, and safe learning environment at school. Some examples are, but not limited to, short shorts. This already broad rule rarely needs to be reinforced at the high school because it isn't a problem. The current dress code implies that girls are responsible enough to make the right choices when dressing themselves for school, at which they are. The high school does not single girls out, does not chase girls down the hallway trying to condemn them, and does not disrupt our lunch to have a talk with us about our wardrobe. To make ourselves clear, this is not a movement against authority or the administration. We understand the need for a dress code and are in no means trying to remove one altogether. However, it is humiliating to walk through the hallways as a young girl, already uncomfortable in your own skin, only to get pulled aside and chastised for wearing shorts when the weather is above 80 degrees. It is humiliating to have to be pulled out of the lunchroom along with every other girl to be lectured, while all the boys look on, hooting and hollering, and continuing to eat their lunches. It is humiliating to be forced to make an appearance on the Selene Middle School announcements as a punishment for wearing running shorts to school. We need to stop humiliating our young girls in a safe environment. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Is there any other public comment? Yes. That's a tough act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> I won't try. <coughs> and I would take this moment um, just to say, I am, my name is Teresa Saunders, and I am um, an assistant professor in the College of Education at Eastern Michigan University. And I serve as consultant on school improvement for the Michigan Department of Education. And one of the things I do is facilitate student voice. And I have to tell you, those girls have voice. <laughs> that said, I'm going to pass and give to the board some documents. I am, I just stopped by because I am running for the vacant seat of the ISD. I just wanted you to know that and put a name with the face. Um, specifically, the ISD, as you know, doesn't deal necessarily directly with local, local school districts. But we do have some issues in common, and one of those being social justice, which you just heard a magnificent conversation regarding. Um, and so there's several other things we anticipate that the ISD will be doing over the next three to five years as budgets become tighter and accountability and responsibility goes up. So um, you have my documentation in front of you. If you have any questions, please, please feel free to call me. Um, I'd love to have a conversation with you about anything regarding education. Thanks. Thank what, you. what district do you reside in? Ypsilanti. Ypsilanti? OK, thank you. Um, I'm Heidi McClellan, and I just wanted to invite everyone as a, a member of the Selene Main Street design team to see the banners downtown that our students um, K through 12 have created, and um, they should be all up now, um, but we are going to hold a ribbon cutting ceremony on Monday, May 18th from at 5 o'clock at the Four Corners, so just want to invite everybody and thank our <laughs> students for submitting some wonderful artwork. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Administration. Uh, just two quick comments. One, I would like, and I'll pass it around, I'd like to thank the um, students at Heritage School. Joel Benedict led the Kids Against Hunger. They made 27,000 meals. Um, the program was partnership with 
the Aquinas Club of Saline and, and had received donations from a variety of organizations <coughs> to support that effort. And again, it's a great opportunity for our students to be involved in that. And then um, as much as I'm not a real big fan of uh, rankings, um, we did see our, our ranking relative to our high school from US News and World Report today. And again, I just like to, you know, that, that building in, in the district is a culmination of a lot of, of hands and effort on the part of our students, our parents, and our staff. And so again, it's, <coughs> Um, well, I don't always trust rankings. I certainly is a positive for thinking and indicative of the time, energy, and effort that goes into educating our students. That's all I have for tonight. Board members? Um, well, we had a foundation meeting this morning, and um, they are busy beavers planning lots of things for next year. Um, just to give you some highlights, um, our kickoff will be October 6th, an evening event this year. Um, they have been busy with sponsor outreach, um, figuring out ways to make a stronger partnership between businesses and the school district. Um, uh, district, um, well, they have been working on what kind of strategic grant that they want to do this year, and they're looking at um, supporting project-based learning at Heritage, and so um, that will be, you'll hear more about that later. They're, they're, trying to still figure out what to call it and stuff like that but um they're they're working towards that um they have hall of fame coming in september um the alumni banquet june 27th that'll be um a lot more communication between the um foundation and the alumni this year um we will have they will have a pup, downtown pup rally where they'll be involved um we have a new student rep that was selected, Allison Proxy. And um, they are working <clears throat> on securing a vehicle, possibly uh, going to be a truck, for the foundation snow blast this year. So lots going on. Thank you, Betty. Just I, I attended the last. Uh, High school PTO meeting talked about the process on the bond and uh, working towards the bond election in November. And then the uh, Sling seniors uh, have their senior day on June 11th. So I'm going to try to get on the agenda of that for about five minutes. That's a key group in getting support from the seniors of the community for the bond. So we're moving forward with that. <clears throat> Um, I um, had a, we went on a busload trip down to uh, Plymouth, Indiana on Friday to visit a school district that does problem-based learning uh, on, a, on a large scale. Uh, it was very interesting. It was very good to see our school employees after we would visit each building start having very good conversations about what we already do and what tips they could get. Um, so it was exciting. Um, last night was the highest honors of distinction event at the high school where they honor the top 5% of the senior class. It's nice to see that. And we're coming into the end of our budget season and I think the citizens of the great state of Michigan spoke last week that they're unhappy with their legislatures and how they passed the road stuff and other associated stuff down to the electorate so i think that was kind of telling so it will be interesting to see since we have to have a balanced budget by the end of june what they will come up with in the next <clears throat> month or so so we're somewhat looking forward to that somewhat not looking forward to that so can i have a recommended motion to approve the agenda as printed so moved. second all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, <clears throat> hearing none, motion carries. Schedule reports. Our student representative is not here yet, so we will skip to B, the Exemplary Education Endeavors Award from the Ann Arbor Gypsy Chamber of Commerce. All right, I'd like to welcome Donna, from the, uh, who's the chairperson of the EE, or the E3 committee. So. Thank you. Hi, everybody. 
Uh, this is my first time at the Celine board meeting. I, somebody else gets to come to these um, presentations, so I'm very, very pleased to be here and meet you all and stand before you representing the uh, Ann Arbor Ypsilanti uh, Chamber. Uh, my name is Donna DeButz, and I worked for the Ypsilanti District Library for 17 and a half years, but have been retired and um, have been, one of my volunteer activities has been working on the E3 award, which stands for Exemplary Educational Endeavors. Um, the chamber, the Ypsilanti Chamber actually established a goal of recognizing educational excellence in Ypsilanti area public schools in 1997. That's when the award was first conceived. It didn't exist before that and, and has been going on ever since. Uh, when Ypsilanti and Ann Arbor Chambers merged then, uh, they decided to continue the E3 as part of this combined chamber effort. And uh, so we have been happy to include Ann Arbor Schools as one of the um, um, basic groups that are in the area. But we've also gone to recognizing out-county um, school districts if they submit a nomination and it meets the criteria. So there will be an award ceremony on Wednesday, May 20th, a, a week from tomorrow, at the Washtenaw Community College um, uh, Morris Lawrence building at 7 a.m. The award recipients will be recognized at that event. They will receive a lovely little trophy and a cash award. The cash award is possible because of Janowick Funeral Homes in Ypsilanti as well as the uh, A2Y Chambers Foundation. So when we first were giving out the awards, there was the trophy, that's what you got. But uh, over the last few years, Sandy Janowick at Janowick Funeral Homes has really felt, and you know, certainly we have seen with the schools, um, that there's a crying need for teachers to have more funds per to perhaps do those things that go off and out and beyond. So anyway, we are real pleased to say tonight I am here to talk about the Out County Award because somebody you guys know um, is the award recipient this year. The uh, E3 Award it recognizes an individual or group, group activity, effort, or program. Okay, it's, it can be any number of things, but it must accomplish one or more of the following five criteria. One, provides enhanced educational experiences for students both inside and outside the classroom. Two, increases parental and community involvement. We feel that's very, very important. Certainly the business community is always looking at you, isn't it, to see how well your school district is doing and how uh, your students do when they go out into the workforce. Three, prepare students to enter the workforce or develop lifelong learning skills. Four, develops innovative initiatives such as business partnerships or career pathways. And five, continues to improve the quality of area public schools. So each nomination that we received, and I think we received 22 this year, um, were judged on those five criteria. A narrative was submitted, somebody made the nomination, and, and we looked at um, the people and the programs and said, yeah, yes, that's a great one, okay? Uh, so like I say, it's the 17th year for the presentation of the awards, and um, we will be getting together next week to do the big fun stuff. But as the time has developed, we think, why not come to the school board and say, here are the programs that your was nominated from your school district. Here is the award that um, somebody can receive, because you may not all be at the breakfast next week. You may not know. Um, how widely thought of and how well he held in estimation uh, some of the programs are that um, we see nominated. So that's why I'm here tonight, to tell you just a little bit about that. One of the benefits of honoring outstanding educational endeavors in our communities is the opportunity to share ideas about each district's exemplary programs and people. In that spirit, I'm here, 
The award recipients will be recognized next week. They'll get a chance to talk. They'll have um, displays set up. So if you come to the breakfast, I don't know if you are normally early edition um, visitors, but if you come, you will see all the award recipients for this year, their display and what it is that their programs are doing. And maybe there'll be a little cross-pollination. You never know how, how that might turn out. So that's the preamble. Um, so the real thing that you want to know is who is it that I'm going to signal out from the audience tonight to come up. Well, we're very pleased that uh, this year we have selected Adam Rodriguez from the Visual Imaging and Advanced Photography um, program through the South and West Washtenaw Consortium. That was the, the program that we thought really deserved the most recognition this particular year. Now, next year, you might think of somebody else that might be uh, a good nomination. Two years ago, I think we recognized Tim Timosek? Timosek? Yeah. Yeah. Automotive Technology for the award. So uh, anyway, I would like to have Adam come up for a moment just to say hi. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the, the program. Um, he is lauded in the nomination as a teacher who goes up and beyond to help his students have real-life experiences with photography and graphics. He has helped his students learn communication skills, discipline, how to meet deadlines, and completion of tasks to a customer's expectations. Each year, students from his program have managed to place in the top ten in the National Skills USA competition. So I'm very, very pleased to present, and you can do whatever you'd like to with this certificate. It's a preamble to the actual trophy, so if there's some sort of brag wall around here somewhere, then you can put that up there. So, thank you. In these difficult times for education, I mean, nobody would argue that we've seen some of the roughest financial and uh, you know support for public education and so we are very very pleased me speaking for the chamber as a volunteer um, to say that we are very 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 um, pleased that these kind of wonderful initiatives these unusually um, exceptional people are in our schools doing the job that they can and touching the students in our communities to make their lives something special and uh, you know productive as the years go on. So thank you so much for your time this evening and I hope to see you next Wednesday. Thank you. Our next scheduled report is class size, Janet Park. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the board, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you tonight about what we feel is a growing vulnerability in our school district class size. I would also like to thank uh, Superintendents Latch and Graydon for your support as we've researched this issue. Uh, you've provided a lot of great information about our school district and uh, we really appreciate how receptive uh, and all the guidance you've provided. Uh, tonight I'm speaking on behalf of the parents and attendants tonight. If anybody could raise their hand if they're here for this issue. <coughs> Thank you. Um, and there are also, I believe, some teachers and staff, maybe some volunteers uh, in the audience. In addition to the many, many others who were unable to attend tonight because of conflicts. I know the first grade Pleasant Ridge music program is tonight. There's a sixth grade choir concert tonight. There's a Celine Main Street meeting tonight. So my email, my phone has been blowing up tonight with parents saying they wish they could come. They would like to be counted as being here even though they are busy running around after their children. Um, a little bit of background. This initiative uh, began largely with parents of the Pleasant Ridge second grade. Uh, the classes in Pleasant Ridge second grade are currently at 30 and 31 students. However, uh, parents district-wide share our concerns um, especially at Heritage. Um, Heritage classes are regularly 38 to 32 students, and uh, there's a team teaching situation over there, which generally works out pretty well, but many times students are in a group of 60 kids. Um, <coughs> speaking from personal experience, that's approaching the size of my college lecture classes. Uh, it's still a lot. Um, so our purpose is that we hope to improve class size in all of our K-6 schools. Um, we're focusing on the elementary level right now because research, research has shown that 
Glass sizes generally um, makes a bigger impact in the lower grades. However, since um, we've started talking about this, I've heard from many middle, middle school and high school parents saying that they also share a concern for class size. So, you know, perhaps that can be in the back of everyone's <coughs> mind um, as we talk about it in the lower grades. Um, we'd like to see changes, you know, all the way through our district. We come forward now because we are invested in Saline Area Schools. Many of us moved into the district or attending the district as a school of choice um, for the high quality education that Saline provides. <coughs> Uh, we want to thank you for your continued commitment to making Saline one of the top schools in the state and for the difficult decisions that you make every day that drives our school to such a level of excellence. We realize that you <coughs> must weigh class size among other important educational and financial factors and we acknowledge that you do so thoughtfully. Parents also value a class size in which our children can thrive and receive personal attention from the outstanding teachers that you commit to hiring here. Um, we come forward now because we feel this uh, may be at risk. We've now reached numbers at which our children's education is being compromised. We feel that we've passed a tipping point where we are observing at school and at home the effects that larger class sizes are having on our kids. So this is not just about you know a number that we don't feel is correct. We feel that um, this year, especially in our second grade, we're seeing these, these things that I'm about to talk about. Um, and also, you know, I was talking with parents in other grade levels, um, you know, maybe classes that don't have this exceptionally large class size mm -hmm. right now. Um, the parents are also starting to see things. You know, you, you get to be 27, 28 kids, um, where we've been in past years and no one's really come forward. But everyone's kind of like, oh, it's, this feels uncomfortable. This year we're really seeing some differences. The concerns that I'm about to review um, have been compiled by a number of parents in varying grades and schools in our district, teachers, um, staff, and classroom volunteers. These are not hypothetical concerns. Uh, throughout the year, I'm pretty sure I can speak for most people in this room that we have witnessed many and various examples of these issues. I won't go into um, you know, very much detail for to save time. Um, you all have the sheet that I um, had emailed earlier. Um, but first and foremost, we're worried about the safety of our students in the classroom. Classroom space gets tight with 31 second graders, and there have been cases this year where there have been, you know, minor accidents, trips and falls, um, kids bumping into things. As a regular classroom volunteer, I can tell you there have been times when it's time for me to go, and I'd like to say goodbye to my daughter. She's across the room from the door, and in order to get to the other side, I have to pick my way around, around the students, so I just don't do that. Um, it's, it's kind of hard to function. Even more importantly, we're concerned about the increased responsibility of the teachers to assist and protect a large number of students in a timely manner in case of an emergency situation. Parents and teachers are also seeing an increase in behavioral issues in the classroom. This includes social problems, um, disagreements among students, disruptive behavior in the classroom, horseplay, among other things. These issues are detracting from the learning environment. In a smaller class, the likelihood that these issues could be noticed and stopped earlier or prevented in the first place would be much greater. And in fact, when our kids have been in smaller classes, that has indeed happened. Our students have been increasingly distracted at school due to these behavior issues, due to the sheer volume of students and the associated activity around them, and the decreased ability of the teachers to provide each child with as much individual attention. With such large classes and increasingly demanding curriculum, teachers are less likely to be able to get to know each child and differentiate their teaching to meet the needs of the students. And in my talking with our wonderful teachers, um, they really like to be able to respond to each student in a timely manner and to meet their needs. After volunteering with a math lesson, one parent recently noted, with a packed curriculum and a class size of 30, it seems nearly impossible to provide instruction and supplemental instruction that meets the needs of all the students in the class. Uh, she really noticed that there was, you know, there's a difference in ability level. And when there's that many kids, it's hard to get to each kid and make sure they're getting what they need. More students also means more teacher time dedicated to evaluations and testing, which has become a reality in our education, which means less teaching time for our students. There's an increased burden on families to finish work that was started at school and to supplement, so supplement these educational gaps. Perhaps most importantly, we're seeing a decreased sense of well-being in our children. Many of us are already concerned about our students' level of stress and anxiety and how this may affect them as they continue into the upper grades. 
Because of these observations, we must urge you to address our district's class sizes. We care about our students' learning experience, and we care about Salinari Schools maintaining its high level of quality education. Besides these obvious detrimental effects on the children, we fear that if not addressed, large class sizes could contribute to decreased test scores, greater achievement gaps among students, more students potentially leaving the district, decreased school of choice applications, and of course, increased stress-related problems. Therefore, we're asking the administration and the school board to address this class size problem on two fronts. One, there are some immediate needs. Um, obviously, the second grade at Pleasant Ridge is exceptionally large. When I say exceptionally large, I mean several students above the district-wide average for second grade. <coughs> Um, a few years ago, there was a similar above average situation at Woodland Meadows. Uh, I believe that was three years ago in the third grade. Um, because of these situations, we feel there's a need to provide an extra teacher for any class which looks to be exceptionally large or larger than the average class size district, class size district wide. We know that enrollment fluctuates until the school year begins. Um, you don't have final enrollment numbers till last minute. <coughs> And of course, students move in and out of the district somewhat during the school year. This year, you know, we've had a few students come in and that's pushed our class size up very high. However, in coming years, we hope to err on the lower end of class size. So if it looks like we're gonna be potentially at that tipping point, we ask you to err on the side of caution. And that staffing decisions can also be made early enough so there's time to prepare for the upcoming school year. You know, instead of scrambling at the last minute. I know, you know, that's, that's a challenge um, but we hope that, that that can occur. So that's the immediate needs that will hopefully uh, remedy our situation at Pleasant Ridge for the upcoming year and also prevent another situation like this happening in another class at Pleasant Ridge or Harvest or Woodland Meadows or Heritage or anywhere. Also, um, there's some long-term needs. Um, you know, our second grade is exceptionally large, but the class size has been creeping up over the past five years and we um, don't want to see that continue. So we'd like to see longer term sustained reduction of overall class size in the grades K through six to a more ideal level. Um, you know, it's difficult to talk about class size numbers that's, you know, depending on finances, we understand. Uh, when I talk about ideal level, I, I believe I'm speaking for the parents that I've heard from that a more ideal level is much lower. Um, there are very real challenges in creating such a policy. Uh, that's gonna require more study and a careful balance of all educational factors. So we're asking that a plan or task force be implemented uh, to prioritize class size. And we'd like to you know, have some routine progress reports to parents of, on, on the progress on reaching those goals. Um, I know I didn't talk a lot about research, but I wanted to focus on tonight was what parents are seeing in our district in the classroom. You know, there have been many, many research studies. I know that you've looked at them. I've talked to the superintendents about um, those research studies. There has been a fairly recent research study. I'm just going to do a handout. I'm not going to go too much into it. Um, it's kind of a study of the research studies, and some of you may have seen it. Um, but it, it corroborates a lot of what I'm saying. I'm just going to pass, you just pass the box around. Thank you very much. So, you know, look at over at your leisure. Um, it has some very interesting information um, and things that is just talking about how class size is, is important. I wanted to thank you for your time, your receptiveness to hearing how the class size is affecting the Saline students. Um, in addition to this urgent call to action, our Saline families have expressed a willingness to participate and help to find a solution to what is a complicated issue. Uh, we hope that you will keep us apprised as you make your decisions regarding the next school year in the future, and uh, we will do whatever we can um, to help and support you in your decisions. Thank you so much for your time. MTSS presentation, Caroline Stout.
set up is Carolyn comes over here. Steve, I don't know if you want to give a Mr. Lott, if you want to give a quick overview of MTSS. Sure. So um, MTSS stands for the Multi-Tiered Systems of Support. It used to be known in our district as RTI, for Response to Intervention, but it's it's recognized that it's taking on a, a much bigger, um, it's a bigger entity in our district now. It includes not only is it looking at academic support, it's looking at behavioral support, and uh, Caroline coordinates that for the entire district. There are also building coordinators at the K through three buildings, as we have primarily targeted the K through three levels based on our research of trying to intervene at a very early level. But now, um, Caroline and her team has expanded it into Heritage, middle school, and the high school, so now, the um, effects are, are reaching a, a greater population of students as well, and we're excited about that. And so her uh, report, uh, progress report tonight will showcase uh, what they've been up to um, in MTSS. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Steve, for pretty much doing half my presentation well, for me. I really appreciate it. <laughs> I have not much left to say. <laughs> my name is Caroline Stout, and I'm really excited um, to present to you guys this evening. Um, because we do have some really nice updates. And like Steve said, there's a lot of lingo, so my hope tonight is to both give an update um, to showcase some of the great work that our students and our staff and our uh, teachers and administrators have been doing over the last five years, and also hopefully um, give you some of the cool intervention lingo that is being used today. So um, like Steve said, the, the language has changed a little bit over the past few years. We started <laughs> off um, using the term response to intervention, which refers to a multi-tiered system of support used to support students with academic difficulties, uh, reading, writing, or math. And um, the term PBIS, Positive Behavioral Interventions and Supports, is the equivalent for behavior and social emotional needs. Um, so this umbrella uh, acronym of MTSS, Multi-Tiered System of Support, is the application of this framework to both academics and behavior. So. Um, we spoke a little bit about how this looks at the high school a few months ago, back when it was cold for real. Um, and so the basic idea is that you start with really high quality differentiated instruction for all, whether it's a core curriculum for academics or um, your behavior expectations for your school for behavior. Um, but we know at any point in time that students are gonna need, some students are gonna need a little bit more. So about five to 15% of the population is gonna need a little bit of extra intervention in tier two, and less than 5% of the students, hopefully, will need more intensive intervention in tier three. That tends to be more individualized, a very small group, and more time. Here, we're talking three to five days a week, maybe 20 to 30 minutes, and, and in tier three, it's more five days a week, 30 minutes. Um, the model is based on the use of student data to drive instruction and to drive the movement between tiers. The hope is always to get students back to the point where they need no further intervention other than tier one. Um, and obviously it involves a great deal of collaboration among all staff in general and special education. So this is a quick overview of some of the things that have happened over the past five years around this use of this model to support students. Um, so for academics, we started back in 2010 using this model with <coughs> tiers one through three for reading, K-1. Um, in 2011, 2012, we add, expanded to second grade and then the year after that to third grade. Um, this year, we started a small pilot um, with two reading tutors mid-year uh, working in tier three reading intervention with a handful of students. Um, and we are planning for uh, how this might look next year at the middle school. Um, to give students support regardless of whether or not they qualify for special education. That's really a big benefit here. Um, with regards to the behavioral and social emotional supports, um, for many years now you've probably walked around the elementary schools and seen things like the Woodland 3Bs or the Harvest 4 or the Pleasant Ridge High 5. Those are all those behavior expectations that were established as part of Tier 1. But what's exciting was that <coughs> last year we started collecting some behavior data that um, had for focus to uh, drive problem solving and and determine who might need extra support. Um, that was called SWISS, School-Wide Information <coughs> System. Unlike discipline data, this has really looked, at trying to look at trends in student um, behavior and needs. So looking at, are there times of day that students struggle? Are there particular um, days of the week that are difficult? Uh, and <coughs> trying to identify the function of behavior so that we can do something about it. 
Um, so that is what's going on in K3 with regards to behavior, and then Selene Middle School and Heritage have been on a similar path. They've established their behavior expectations around being respectful, responsible, and kind of necessary. And now they're working on collecting some of that data to then um, add some supports into your two tier three to help students um, with social and emotional needs. I, I think you, you know, I'll jump in and interject here. I, so when, when you see those types of things that are in our buildings and how we branded those buildings, I want people to understand and the board to understand those are more than just, hey, these are, are kind of catchphrases that we've established. There's a targeted approach to student behavior. When we talk about social emotional support, social emotional welfare of our students, we want to have these shared behavior expectations and then a way to collect data related to those and then provide interventions as necessary. So it's more than just these are just good things to do and how we're trying our students to teach for each other. There's a, a, essentially, I don't say a scientific, but there's a strategy behind what we're doing at those building levels in order to make sure those environments are appropriate for our students' learning. Thank you, Scott. And, and there is a science behind it, quite a bit of research behind this, this model in general. And, and you're right, the idea is that um, for one, it's fair to the students to teach them really about the game of school and what we expect for them to do. And two, if we have consistent language and consistent expectations across all areas, we see that in general there's much less of a need for supports in general. Students um, feel like the school is much more fair. Um, they feel like you know they, they understand that the behavior should be the same whether they're in the cafeteria or in, in um, art or in the classroom. Obviously, things change a little bit, but the basic idea of respect and responsibility and safety remains. Um, another buzzword that you might have heard is the term best fit groups. Um, that is one that we uh, are using at the K-3 level and started in 2012. Um, this is really a scheduling trick to be able to provide that kind of intervention support um, in tiers two and three. We started it in 2012 because that's when we uh, expanded this model to include third grade and this was the way to do it while not adding staff, honestly. Um, the idea is that for a half hour um, at a time, so a half hour for each grade level, uh, we <clears throat> regroup all the students based on their reading needs. So this is in addition to the reading instruction um, and we regroup them based on those that need some extension work. So there's a lot of project-based learning opportunities there and opportunities to use technology. Um, and levels or and on level groups uh, that are working on reinforcement you'll notice the bubbles are bigger those groups tend to be a little bit bigger um, and then the tier two and tier three intervention groups for students who need remediation can then be smaller um, and we regroup four times a year so we want to make sure that students are moving out of those intervention groups into the, the bigger groups um, so this makes some sense so um, the rest of the presentation, I'm going to try to make data as exciting as it can possibly be um, because short of bringing the students in or putting up their picture, which would break confidentiality, um, I wanted to just showcase some of the real big successes that um, our staff has had with, with um, this all the way from the curriculum to uh, intensive intervention. So the next several graphs will focus on uh, our DIBBLES data, which stands for Dynamic Indicators of Basic Early Literacy Skills. It's a set of measures that we use to screen um, students three times a year. They're one minute each, and we measure different skills um, from phonemic awareness in kindergarten and phonics, phonemic awareness being the ability to hear and manipulate sounds, phonics that matched to um, letters, um, to comprehension, retail, um, and, and uh, beyond. So. This is looking at the percent of students that meet benchmark at any time of year. Benchmark is important because um, that is the level at which we can be very confident that students will be successful in reading um, up to a year out. So basically, if you meet this threshold, um, your odds are 80 to 90% of being just on your way to meet the next grade level standard without any extra intervention. Um, at any point in time, we want to see at least 80% of students at benchmark, ideally, because that means that we're providing intervention to less than 20% of our students. And that's not only manageable, that's what we know of needs of any of us at any point in time in our education, right? We shouldn't have 50% of us needing remediation. Um, so if you see the green is five years ago when we first started. Um, a few things to note, this is kindergarten data. The um, purplish sort of color um, is the first year that we had full day kindergarten and a new reading curriculum. 
So hopefully it's obvious that that made a positive impact. Um, our students come, we are very lucky, our students come to us already with a lot of great skills. Um, but the fact that we were able to reach the high 80s here and then maintain that at 89% of our students at Benchmark was, was really um, amazing. The year after that, we also, another thing about this model is that we're constantly learning from our students and learning from this data. So the year after that, um, we were on target and then um, we had a lot of discussions about what happened between um, the, the mid-year and the end of the year. There were 10 snow days, but that's not an excuse. So we're learning a lot. And this year, our data is already looking um, a lot better. And again, I can't stress enough that these might be numbers, but they represent students. And that's really amazing. So we have the um, highest percentage yet in year now in kindergarten. So to make this a little more real, um, I wanted to showcase an example of a student for each grade. So this is a kindergartner who came to us in the fall with, um, without being able to really hear the, that there are sounds and words, which is makes reading difficult. Um, and so this is uh, the way that we um, make sure that we're monitoring progress carefully is we pick whatever Dibble's measure in, um, in, the, or in our toolbox best fit um, their need. So this is first sound fluency. It's a measure of phonemic awareness. And we monitor their progress every two weeks. And then we also have frequent conversations with the teacher and cross-check this, this with other reading data. So this was the student's goal line we were hoping to get here by January. This student has done very, very well. Um, they now are able to segment words into their sounds. By mid-year, um, the student was still struggling with letter names. So in collaboration with the parents, the family worked really hard over Christmas break and um, capital and lowercase letters, and now the student no longer needs intervention after half a year, which is really exciting. Um, our first grade scores district-wide, again, um, show the improvements over time, which is very exciting. And I want to point out in these next few, this middle of the year, this year um, column is particularly exciting because um, obviously it's still fairly fresh. In a few weeks, we'll have that last one filled in. But um, we are consistently seeing now over 80% of our students at Benchmark, which is very, very good news for all of us. Um, and the other thing is we are seeing the effects over time of students coming in with a better foundation. Uh, this is a first grade student example. This student um, had one area in their um, liter early literacy skills that was a little bit low, and that's their basic phonics skills. Um, and so they've been working in a tier two intervention and making steady progress, again, above their aim line, um, still needing intervention by mid-year, and um, successful with it. And that's the other thing that we want to make sure is if, if that's what the student needs, that we can continue to provide that, which is um, ideal. Um, second grade, again, great trends. By the middle of the year, this year, we had 90% of our students, again, at benchmark. So that means, now there are other data points that we consider, but generally that means that we have 10% of our students who definitely need intervention, and that is, that is not um, very much. Um, so an example of a second grader um, and success story here as well. So this is a particularly interesting student because um, they were with us in kindergarten and then moved to Germany for first grade and came back and had and pretty much missed <coughs> some first grade instruction in, in reading English. And so uh, came into second grade really needing some first grade skills. So with this model, we were able to provide that for them um, for Rose and uh, focus first on some basic skills for the course in phonics and now sort of graduate to uh, higher level skills like fluency and comprehension. These are the progress um, graphs for fluency and comprehension. Again, she continues to need the help, but is benefiting from it, and that's really what we want to see. Um, third grade, again, we're continuing to see you know, the trend of students coming in higher than they were before with the support in the earlier grades. And a third grade student, actually from last year, um, because for this, uh, for this um, guy that we're nicknaming Charlie, he came in reading six words per minute with 21% accuracy in third grade, moved into the district last year. 21% accuracy, right, means that one word is correct for every five, which is pretty um, bad. Um, and over the course of the year, improved accuracy and fluency at the end of the year was reading with 92% accuracy and 68 words correct per minute. 
Um, although that is still considered at risk, below that red cut line, you can see that for Charlie, that made a big difference. Um, what's interesting is that now at Heritage, uh, even though it took us a good half a year to get the support going, he is now able to also get some intervention at Heritage and continues to do well and just recently hit 98% accuracy. So again, seeing that from grade to grade, we're able to continue to um, provide those supports to students, whether or not they qualify for special education. In fact, most of them really don't. Um, is really powerful. Um, there's obviously always more to do, so here are some of the things that we're hoping to accomplish in the next few years, talking about adding intervention for um, math, um, continuing to just foster that collaboration between general and special education that allows for this kind of work to happen, um, expanding on the behavioral and social emotional supports at all levels, and then also working on um, constantly looking at what we can do better for all students. One of the things that we're doing is um, adding a new tier one phonics curriculum for K3. So um, I just have to say, I love what I do. Thank you for the support that you've given um, our schools and our students in being able to put this kind of model in place. Um, and there's my email if you have any questions. And we also have a website that's linked to all the school websites too, if you want more. Thank you. Action items. Can I have a recommended motion to approve the CARES Discretionary Funds Round 2 recommendation to award $7,269.28 as submitted by Community Education Director Buffer? Hold on. All those in favor, please say goodbye by saying aye. Uh, oh, wait, I'm sorry, discussion. Okay. We did want to let you so not talk about it. Like All right. Well, as you can see, we have four grants that were submitted. Uh, the committee recommended to approve three of those grants for a full or a partial amount. Uh, as you can see, the grants are the ADA door openers, the rec center. The, com the committee agreed to pay 50% of the grant. They discussed the grant in great detail. They feel the rec center is better off financially, and they should either find other funding for the amount or pay it themselves. The doors would be located in the pool hallway in a family entrance. Then the committee also agreed to fully fund the grant to purchase nine square air game, which I was talking to Shannon Gray trying to figure out how to explain this to you, so I'll pick up these last <laughs> You want to take a look at that? It's basically uh, it's told kind of like four square, but nine square. I don't know, typically know the rules, but it's very, you can break it down. Uh, PE classes use it quite a bit. I guess some of ours may or may not have it, but the rec center would be willing to uh, share with PE, use it at community events and whatnot, but it sounds like it's a new and upcoming game, so it's called nine square uh, air, I believe is what it's called. Um, they fully uh, agree to uh, fund that one. They feels a new initiative for his facilities, which is the AD door handles, which they only did um, 50%. And the third one they recommended for was the life skills recumbent bike for the Slain High School Life Skills Program. I believe they received uh, funding for a bike probably about five years ago. We used it quite a bit. And so they fully they, uh, agreed to um, fully recommend the fund that grant. Questions? What, uh, what percentage of the CARES funds goes to the rec center? For a year, or yeah, just historically. I mean, I'm hitting the cold, but I'd you know. say, I guess historically, I'd say thirty, maybe thirty percent, probably. Okay. I would say. I mean, that's guessing, but since two thousand one, I almost got to think I'm off. Yeah, I think that's probably about right. And obviously, once the, the renovation kind of component that was a part of a multi-year grant award, if you factor that out, it's much smaller. But that obviously would be significant. Chunk during yeah. that period of time. This is our last round for this year. Right? Correct. Yep. Would the board be allowed to do nine squares for next event? I think so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the purchases are picking up. That's good. Good bonding. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed. Hearing none. Motion carries. Thank you, Brian.
Can I have a motion to approve the bond restructuring resolution as submitted by Assistant Superintendent Warner? So moved. Second. 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 Great. Um, I'll take it to. Uh, in 2012, we had to refinance our 2002 bonds, and at that time, we went with floating rate notes um, for a term of three years, and that term expires on November 1st, 2015. Um, we'll either need to set a new rate on the bonds, replace the current structure, or refinance the bonds, and this resolution will allow, allow us to start that process. Stoddard Barch and Associates will be helping us through that process. Um, at the close of this fiscal year, that 2012 debt balance should be about $75.5 and million. And it started at? $124? Uh, uh, $124 was the full Yeah, that sounds about right. Mm -hmm. And we paid down to that in uh, 12 years? Mm. Well, that was what built the high school and stuff, right? Right, yeah. built the high school, so but it's going to get into the fact that we've, we're front loaded with drawing from the school bond loan fund and right. it, it's being involved right. in this. So. It's not an easy answer. It's <laughs> my, my first <laughs> year. The whole bonds thing. Okay. So we're looking to find a, a better, well, a, a good a rate. Comparable, comparable, yeah, hopefully a little better. And this will launch a RFP process. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yes, <clears throat> All those in favor, please signify it by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. Can I have a motion to approve the 2015-2016 WISD budget as presented by Superintendent Grady? Second. Okay. Superintendent Gray. I'm gonna. I, we have two distinguished guests for tonight. Uh, Superintendent ISD Scott Benzel and uh, Brian Marcel, who's official from the WISD. Um, we have a printed um, copy in your packet of the uh, of their report. Essentially, the budget review. And again, tonight we're, we're essentially doing the general ed budget. However, there's going to be a conversation relative to the special education budget. So thank you for the opportunity to talk for just a few minutes, and it's always fun to watch what's going on uh, in a local school district, and so we appreciate the opportunity to come out and talk. You're the first district that we get to discuss uh, outside of the WASB uh, format where we bring in every district to go over our, our budget details. I'm gonna let Brian do most of the talking, but I did wanna tell you that when Scott sent the email request and I said, you know, do you want the full budget presentation? He said, no, we want the short version. He said, you know, just highlight a couple of things, including FB trends. So I was going to share our Facebook trends with you, but then I realized that he really wanted to talk about a fund balance. So Brian's going to walk through those details, and, and we'll be happy to answer any questions. And believe it or not, that is the shortened version that Scott made a copy of. Um, and thanks for making the copies. And the distinguished guest comment, I hadn't heard that one before. So we don't get that with that one, so. Um, so starting with the, the not the cover, obviously, but the first page. Um, this is not something we'd normally have had in the packet if this has been distributed to before. Um, we did have what we consider to be a significant budget matter and wanted to make sure it got called out to all the school districts as they reviewed our, our, board, our uh, budgets. Um, this one does have to do with the special education fund. Um, and in two, February 2015, the, the board of WISD approved our budget amendment for the year. Um, and if you were to look at the full presentation, I don't know if Scott had distributed that to you before or not, but if you did, there were some slides in there that were titled based on the amended budget, and then there were other ones that were based on the projected budget. Um, and that's sort of the first paragraph talks about. Um, and then in March, the Washington Superintendents Association, who's provided guidance um, to Scott and our administration and our board, um, about what to do with the special education fund and where we want the reimbursement to be, that kind of thing. Um, passed a resolution um, to create a, um, a restatement of the 2013-14 fiscal year, um, in which case uh, the, any reserves that would be on hand at the ISD would be distributed to local districts based on the 2013-14 year. 
Um, and so it would re re require a restatement of the 13, 14 year, and it would show on our budget as a transfer in 14, 15, but it's actually a restatement of those costs because they were static and it, it didn't allow anyone to basically spend a bunch of money at the end of the year to get any more money. So um, it was a nice static number. It then also, um, the resolution that they passed uh, established sort of a, a fund balance level for our board to consider it being $3 million for the special education fund. Um, at the time, we actually did the original presentation and presented this to the um, Washington Association of School Boards a few weeks ago. Um, our board had not acted on that yet. They have now, and they have adopted the resolution that was proposed by the Washington Superintendent Association. So the things that are in your packet today are all based on what was the projected budget, which includes those, those assumptions. Um, the one thing I'll addition I'll say, because if I forget it later, I'll kick myself. Um, part of the, the point of making that transition of, of basically taking the special education fund balance um, and transferring it to the local school districts was it gets the dollars that, that were um, there for the ISD to help manage various um, cost differences that happened at the local school district level um, to temper the reimbursement that we give out um, to actually transfer that reserve to the local district level. And so if there are variations that happen in your costs, you can manage them at the local level as opposed to having it being handled at the ISD. So for us, it didn't really matter which way, or, you know, whether the money was held at the ISD or whether it was held at the local districts. We just wanted to make sure local districts understand that while you get this additional reimbursement this year, um, that it really is not, um, that this trend is going to continue going into the future um, and that it was really intended to um, basically take you through the next few years um, to temper the drop that's going to happen. So, so for example, for the for the portion that would be considered Celine dollars, when you restate 13, 14, our special ed funds, it's a little over a million dollars that would come to Celine in a, in a one-time payment towards the end of the current fiscal year. So it, it essentially will, will help us in the short term from on, on paper, but I think what we we're talking about is developing a strategy associated with those dollars related to rate stabilization. If you recall, the, the reimbursement rate from the ISD um, through Act 18 has gone up and down relative to the economy because, again, those dollars are generated locally based on local property taxes and don't go through Lansing. In doing so, um, what we need to consider is a portion of those dollars to maybe restate what we intend to have as our reimbursement rate internally. Again, moving it from previously controlled by the ISD through uh, recommendations from the WSA to, to Slate. So I think at the budget committee level, we need to really think about what that looks like. Right. Um, now, in the short term, it will allow us in our phone balance, good, but again, I just want to reiterate, this is a one-time kind of reimbursement. It will not be something that continues uh, into the future. And there's some graphs you know, further in that will show sort of what's happened with that reimbursement percentage. So. Um, the next page is sort of a big picture view of our um, general education and special education budgets. As Scott mentioned, um, you're actually acting on the general education budget, which is the bottom bars. But you can see the relative size of the special education budget, which is why we also present that um, to the local districts. And you can see for 15-16, um, based on that um, previous slide, we're projecting that the ending fund balance will be 2.98 million, which was within the $3 million level that was established. And everything that will be coming in through property taxes and grants will actually be spent next year. That's the top part. On the general education side, um, you'll see that our revenue for the year is an, uh, estimated to be about 17.7 million, and we're spending about 18.4, which means we'll be spending about $700,000 of our general ed fund balance next year. Um, at the end of 15-16, um, we're estimating that to be about $1.2 million that will be left um, in the general <coughs> education fund. As a percentage um, of expenditures, um, if you were to look at the overall general education fund, it's about a 7% fund balance. Um, however, when you look and take um, what we call our regular budget, which is sort of the non-grant services that we have, our grants in this fund account for about $15 million of the revenue, I'm sorry, $14 million of the revenue that we get. So if you exclude that and look at that $1.2 million, it's about 29% of what our fund balance is in the general education fund. Um, we realize it's on, it's on the downward trend and that's going to need to be acted on. Um, and that will be part of our summer work that we're going to be working on as an administrative team and along with our board. 
Um, the next slide is a pie chart that uh, sort of gives an overall view of the WISD expenditures. It's a combination of the general ed fund and the special education fund together. Um, the bars, I don't know uh, if you have colors or not, but the one on the left hand side, I'm going to talk about the three large slices. The one the large one on the left hand side, the funds transferred to local districts is about 38.5%. That's actually checks that are written to each of the, of the individual school districts. The earmarked grants and programs, the bottom right there is about 31% of our overall budget. Um, that is grants such as the uh, Individuals with Disabilities Act, um, the GSRP grant, all the grants that are basically operated mainly as programs by local districts, and then we reimburse you for many of those, those dollars. Um, so those are actually a lot of dollars that are transferred to you too for part to the subsidy of the operations. And then the next biggest piece is the one right above that, which is the direct special education services. Um, and though that's the cost of the special education programs for the students that are sent to the ISD um, for the programming that's held there. So if you add those three bar, there's three pieces together where it's about 91% of our overall budget is either direct dollars that are transferred to you um, or our direct student services that are provided to the students that come to our programs. Um, the next graph sort of gives you a picture of the overall general special education fund. I just wanted to give you this just so you knew sort of where the money came from. Um, and as Scott mentioned, is very property tax based. Um, almost the entire local bar there um, is property tax revenue. Um, we re get reimbursed for state revenue just like you do, the same 28.6% of your special education expenditures. Um, the $10 million in federal grants is the IDA grant, which we transfer most of that out to you. Um, the next graph is our uh, sort of graph of the outgoing transfer, which for us is the dollars that we're transferring out to the local school districts. Um, you can see the bump in the 2015 bar that is the includes that restatement of the 13-14 year. Um, so it, it increased the bar if you somewhere between seven and eight million dollars. So if you look at that, that's what their uh, emphasis is on this slide. And the next slide, um, this is one where it gets a little complicated if you're not used to looking at these kinds of graphs, but it puts two things on the same piece. The, uh, the ability of us to pay out uh, the reimbursement is directly tied to how much money is coming in on property taxes. So we put them both on the same graph. Um, the bar part of the graph is the property tax revenue, and that scale is over on the right-hand side. So it's 48 million, 50 million, 52 million, and that deals with the bars. The reimbursement percentage is the amount of um, added, what's called added costs, the dollars you're spending after you get your state reimbursement. Um, and that's that percentage that Scott had mentioned earlier, um, and that scale is on the left-hand side. So as you can see, the, the property tax revenue was increasing from 2005, six to 2008, nine, nine, 10. And then as that went down, our fund balance started to decrease. And so that's when the reimbursement percentage had to start to decrease. Um, and that was managed, as I mentioned before, through consultation with the Washington Superintendent Association. Um, and then of course you see the spike, which is the restatement of the 13, 14 year. Um, and then, of course, the, this year we're at a 70% reimbursement for 14-15. And then for 15-16, um, the, sort of the, the picture changes. It won't really be like we're going to spotlight a percentage and say that's how much we're going to reimburse. There's actually going to be a, a pool of dollars that's available to be sent out to all the local school districts. Um, and what, at least what we're currently talking about, I think the Superintendent Association are going to consider this, is actually basing the reimbursement that's going to happen on two years ago's information on the 13-14 year, nothing related to the restatement of 13-14. The reason being is that if you have a pool of dollars and District A gets 10% of that, and District B gets 5% of that, and then there's all the other districts, um, because of the amount of money they spend. If that District A decides they need to spend more money, and so their in expenditures increase and the pool is static, that district's now going to get more money. And so if we base it on current year expenditures, which is what we've been doing in the past, just because District A spent more money means District B is now going to get less. And of course they weren't planning on getting less, they were planning on getting what they were thinking they were getting in the first place. 
So in order to take out that, that variability and, and what the reimbursement's gonna be, suggestion to the business managers group, which Janice is a part of, um, was to actually base the reimbursement on a two years ago information, cost information. And that way, as you budget for your you know, 15, 16 year, be based on 13, 14, there's no chance it's going to change because those dollars are now locked in. It's been state approved as to what those dollars are, and so that variability is taken out from a budgeting standpoint at the local district level. So, so to, to kind of talk a little bit about that, one of the things, one of the concepts behind I think this model, um, in one, a conversation we've had in depth at the, with the other superintendents and, and I've had with Scott and the ISD is that we want to drive a level of accountability in terms of our cost structures um, and to the extent that, that it's a district level issue or an ISD issue when it comes to how we're spending our resources it's important that it not be masked somehow by this fluctuation in, in, in terms of how we handle how we draw down on fund balance I think it's important that um, given where we're at given the, the importance of these dollars how do we manage them at the local level and ultimately this, this issue of shared accountability one district says that or the ISD starts to spend uh, more than, their, than a certain percentage and then it impacts us directly and, and we have a two-year window now to address that but ultimately we want to make sure there's a level of account, shared accountability to how these dollars are spent the only other thing I'll mention on this graph is that um, if we were to have retained those funds back at the ISD um, the 2016-17 dot would have been in the exact same place. It's just a matter of moving it from that 13-14 year to the between that and the 15-16 year. So it just the, the slope would have been more steady as opposed to a precipitous drop at the end there. So um, it, it didn't really matter. We'd have ended up in the same place. But that's the point about the million dollars is instead of having a steady drop here, you know, you're now having a more a more steep incline. Um, and to adjust for that rate uh, at the local district level. Um, I'll go quickly through the next couple of slides. Um, the only thing I wanted to point out on, on this slide is that we did assume an increase of about 2% for property taxes. Um, this, of course, was, for our board, was done back in March um, prior to us getting um, taxable values from Washtenaw County. Um, we also have four other counties that we have property in. Uh, but obviously Washington is our largest piece. Um, they're estimating the property taxes to be closer to the 2.9% level. I don't know where the other counties will be, but it will definitely be more than 2%, which means there'll be additional funds available to be dispersed um, to you for reimbursing you for your special ed costs. Um, nothing on the next slide. The other one I, I wanted to point out is the slide after that it starts with the bullet for added costs for additional staff. Um, I just want to make sure that, that this got mentioned is that the additions for staff are all student-based services that we included in the budget. Um, and this sort of outlines the reasons as to why those, if there were any additions for staff, why those additions were made. And then in the following slide, um, there are some uh, things going in the other direction where we have reduced expenditures. Um, I won't mention the first one. It's the reason we do this presentation is because you, you get a um, three-year budget picture when you approve a budget. You have 13, 14, 14, 15, and 15, 16. All these notes will sort of take you through all of those various changes. So the ones that actually affect next year's budget um, start with the second bullet where we've um, eliminated a 1.0 business office position and then two half-time technology positions uh, totaling 1.0 FTEs. Um, we've reduced um, some expenditures in the facilities area, about $32,000. Um, there was an increase um, on the technology budget. If you were to look at the 280 section of the budget, it shows an increase in expenditures. That was for the um, uh, licensing and maintenance costs uh, related to the TINET software, which is special ed student management software. Um, that's a countywide purchase for all the districts. Um, and then on the last page, we talked enough about the first bullet. Uh, the second bullet is, the, if you were to look at 14-15, we had, or 13-14, we had a $3 million um, transfer to our capital projects fund. Um, and then if, for 14-15, it was down to 500,000. So the next slide looks at what's happening with our special education fund balance. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but as you can see, it's dropping um, for 14-15 down to that $2.98 million. And as we talked about in the very first graph, um, it will stay at that way because we're spending uh, everything that's coming in. On the general ed side, um, you can see that our graph looks drastically different than it did on the special education side. 
Um, we don't get very much uh, property tax revenue in our general education fund. Um, our millage rate is actually less than one tenth of a mill um, on special on general education. Uh, it brings in about a million three to a million four every year. Um, the other dollars that are in the local dollars are actually um, contributions and, and shared dollars and shared services that we do uh, and shared cooperative purchasing that we do with, with the local districts. I just wanted to include this so you kind of knew um, the difference between how our general ed and special education funds um, get their funds from. Uh, again, the second next page, uh, we included the same 2% increase in property taxes. Um, the next slide, again, just takes you from 13, 14, 14, 15, 15, 16. Um, and then corresponding with some of the changes that were on the um, special education side, the next slide starts with the eliminated grants department assistant. Um, these are some of the reductions that we've made. Um, so we reduced the grants department assistant position. Uh, we eliminated a 0.6 instructional supervisor. Uh, we had to reduce our curriculum instruction support um, by about $58,000 and Naomi Norman has, uh, from our staff, has gone through and made some reductions there. Um, trying to keep it as much away from the services that, that directly impact um, your programs. Uh, we have another $60,000 that we're looking at saving um, on the staffing side, uh, which will be addressed between now and the formal adoption of our budget at the end of June. Uh, the special education side of the business office and technology reductions are also noted here. Same thing with the facility side, it has a $40,000 impact um, on our general education budget. On the next page, there was an ad. Um, again, this was at the request of the Washington Superintendent Association um, to add some additional bandwidth um, for the wide area network. Um, and so that was it had a cost of about $130,000 and then there's some other notes about other changes that have happened in general education. Um, next graph shows the trend in fund balance in our general education fund. Um, and as you can see, as I mentioned before, we'll end up at about $1.2 million by the end of this year. Um, overall, we, you know, we're still in a, in a healthy position if you look at it as 7% or 29% of our expenditures. Um, but we know we need to change the trajectory on, on that and, and level that off about where we're at right now. So, um, I won't go into any detail on the next thing. There are just some slides on, on sort of some uh, compensation issues and where our health insurance coverage is um, in regards to uh, deductibles and coinsurance and where uh, prescription copays are, um, and that there are some districts have a, a reimbursement, like a health savings account that's being reimbursed for that. There's there's no health savings reimbursement. Those are that's just where our health insurance plans are. In kind of in closing, before we get to the, the board has any questions, I will say you know, one of the concepts and one of the discussion points that I had with, with Scott and kind of had as a group, it's important that in, the, in this current level of, of accountability and certainly the current level of funding that to the extent that, that we're all managing our, our funds effectively, it's important that we continue to provide a level of service. And I'll use the example. Their fund balance trajectory doesn't look that much different than ours in some ways in terms of what we've over the last several years. Um, given some of the things that we face, it's, it's gone down significantly. Um, just as the parents who are here about our class size still continue to have high expectations of the level of service as we manage our funds, the idea that we are simply going to um, cut services related to managing our budget isn't, a, isn't a, a really a reality. We need to make sure we're figuring out ways within our own operations to maximize those services that are provided, in this case to the locals, while managing our finances. So the conversation has been really around how do you go about doing that, how do you go best about doing that, and the difficult choices that we really want to see make sure that ISD is making, because it, it, it is something where those dollars need to come and support the students to the extent possible. And, and if I can add, we've taken a two-year approach on the general fund side. Again, we don't have a lot of discretion uh, in terms of the, the uh, general fund dollars, uh, state and, and local taxes. But with respect to that, we did make some reductions this year. And our conversation with the board is to look at not only cuts for next year, but also revenue generation. If you look at ISDs across the country or educational service agencies, most of them have to be very entrepreneurial in terms of how they're structured uh, in order to survive because they don't have even the, the limited amount of tax base that we have as their core funding. And so over the course of the next year, that's part of our work as an administrative team is to figure out what are those other revenue generating opportunities so that we can maintain an enhanced service to the local districts. 
and we'd be happy to answer any questions. I'm curious as to what services have been um, reduced as a result. In terms of our current budget cuts, mm -hmm. um, we've been, it, Brian mentioned, you know, there was a position in the business office and we've been pretty lean anyway that we intended to fill. Uh, so we're not going to fill that. We have two half-time positions in the tech department. Uh, so what, what ends up happening when we don't either fill vacancies or we eliminate positions like that is that the, the remaining staff pick up more. It's similar to what happens in your operation. And most of our budget, like yours, are, are staffing costs. Um, and so it's really about the people in the organization and how we redistribute the workload. Go ahead. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Carrying down the motion carries. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. <coughs> Discussion items. Uh, WISD biennial election. Um, this is a, well, no, it's a discussion. I mean, it just comes to the board tonight, and then we'll be back on the agenda on the 26th for action. Um, again, as noted, this is the biennial election, and uh, we did have the candidate here tonight, uh, the lone candidate, correct, Scott? Yes, that is correct. To make sure this was on the agenda. We just do a motion. Okay. Next, yeah, we're going to have to take action. Uh, so there's only one candidate. So one candidate. Can I have a motion to authorize the following items as part of the consent agenda? A, B, C, D, and E. So mm -hmm. moved. Second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Hearing that motion passes. Um, items on the next <coughs> agenda. We'll have a budget committee report. Yes, okay. we're meeting on Monday. Policy are you guys meeting? Maybe. Maybe. We'll see. The reality is the we next don't have one the, the next meeting, the big agenda item is Mr. Brad Bizu and uh, all the great things going on at Pleasant Ridge. <laughs> it's not on fire, correct? Is that it's still standing. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's really like it. It might get fed that night. Yes, yeah. Oh, yeah. Actually, we do have a, a pretty nice setup for us at our next board meeting. We're going to have our third grade uh, safety patrol team join us, as well as Lori Wells back with third grade students. They're going to do uh, some of their old Michigan, my Michigan uh, playing. Just highlight everything in Pleasant Ridge. So we're uh, excited to have you. At our next board meeting at Pleasant Thank you, Brad. So this is the second opportunity for public comment. Do we have anyone that would like to comment? Okay, our next meeting will be Tuesday, May 26th at 6.30 p.m. at the Pleasant Ridge Media Center, hosted by Mr. Brad Izu and his staff. We will now have a closed session. Um, at the end of the closed session, there will be no action taken by the board. Can I have a recommended motion to enter closed session of the Board of Education at 8 p.m. with the intent to re-enter open session at 8.30 p.m. for the purpose of attorney-client privilege? This is a roll call vote. Trustee Pettis? Yes. Trustee Brees? Yes. Vice President Holden? Yes. President Heinick is a yes. Secretary Delhay? Yes. Trustee Austin? Yes. Trustee Heft? Yes. Yes. So we will take a five minute break and go into the closed session. <laughs>